Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is a Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. Welcome back, everybody. Mike Dillard here. I am coming to you from the road in beautiful Aspen, Colorado, and we have an amazing episode for you here today. Now, most of us will go through a major crucible at one point or another in our lives, the kind that can completely destroy your world and leave you broken. It could be a divorce, a lawsuit, a death in the family, the destruction of a business, or maybe some kind of deadly disease. Well, how you choose to handle this kind of challenge is what will define your future moving forward. Well, Richard Cooper went through his crucible just a few years ago around the age of 40. During a five-year span, he went through a divorce two years after his daughter was born and lost everything to his ex. And during that same period, the company he had started 10 years previously was being threatened with a government policy change that could put him out of business. So his family was gone, his money was gone, and his business was about to be destroyed. As a result, he was constantly experiencing symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and thoughts of suicide started to look more and more appealing. And then one day, Richard was handed a copy of a book called The Rational Mail, and it was a moment that would change the course of his life. It allowed him to define a new vision for his future, one that would turn him into an advocate for men everywhere who are going through their crucible. So if you are going through a challenging period, or if you are simply not the kind of man that you would like to be, today's interview will absolutely change your life. Please help me welcome Richard Cooper. Well, Richard Cooper, welcome to Self Made Man. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, man. Absolutely. So, I came across your channel on YouTube a couple of weeks ago, and it's been one of the the few times that I've dove into something in in a what you would quote unquote call a binge fashion, <laughs> um, <laughs> video after video, probably three, four, five of them in a row. You know, uh, every day whenever I have a chance. And was just so impressed by the way that you share your life's experiences, what you've learned about essentially self-development, being the best man that you can be, uh, relationships specifically, and the fact that you're, you're into cars, uh, as I am, was uh, pretty badass as well. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. And I wanted to see if we could start, as we usually do here on the show, with your story. I've picked up snippets of it from your videos and I, you know, I could really relate to a lot of the challenges that you've gone through in your evolution as a man. But if you could bring uh, our audience up to speed on who you are and, and how you've become who you are today. All right. So the origin story. Well, I guess we'll kind of do the origin story of um, what pushed me into creating content on YouTube because it was, uh, it was a time in my life when I was stuck in my business. I, I live in Canada. I've got a business that I've run for the last 12, 15 years at, uh, I didn't have as much passion for as I did when I started it. I've always been a guy that's uh, figured out that he likes cars and being around entrepreneurs. So I figured I'd, I'd, I'd try to mash up that passion of being around fast cars and cool people that I really enjoy spending time around with. I guess it started out for me with the idea or the notion anyway, let's get together with uh, successful entrepreneurs that have you know their own success rides, hop in the car, strap a GoPro on and tell that story. And I did a whole bunch of those early on and I ran out of friends real quick that had cool cars and stories to tell that were entrepreneurs. So I started kind of filling that gap in with business tips, you know, things like how I hire people with parties, how I use lawyers in my business when I need them and stuff like that. And then one day somebody came along, I don't know, it was about a year and a half into the channel. And this was after I was divorced, after I'd gone through a bunch of legislative issues with the government changing laws that basically were designed to put one of my companies out of business. I was talking a lot about, you know, becoming a better version of yourself and more self-awareness. And somebody said, well, make a video on the types of women to avoid dating. I was like, all right, let's go down this rabbit hole. So I just kind of, <laughs> I just kind of had a, a recent experience at that time with a, with a really bad candidate on the sexual marketplace who nailed off three items. And I did a video on that. And that one got picked up on the algorithms and people watched it like crazy. So I figured, huh, I'm kind of onto something. But at that time, I was still fairly plugged into social conditioning that led me to believe a lot of things that weren't true in my life that failed me throughout my life. Things like just man up and be a man and, you know, just find somebody and settle down and suck it up and all that sort of stuff. And um, I was really struggling with it. And I was at a uh, men's retreat 
And I was talking to this guy and he introduced me to a book called The Rational Male by Rollo Tomasi. And I read that on the, well, I didn't read it, sorry, I listened to it on the flight back. And that was, that was like drinking from a fire hose. Um, there's so much information there for men that you got to go through it a whole bunch of times to really get it all. And I started going down this journey of kind of explaining lessons that I had learned in life about, you know, the sexual marketplace, men's value on the sexual marketplace, female nature, because it's a sticking point for so many guys. I mean, we are men, we've got testosterone running through our veins. We want to be around attractive women. They want to be around successful men. So it's like, how do we become better versions of ourselves as guys and embrace the truths, you know, the real truths, like the red pill truths, not the stuff that we've been lied to all our lives and um, just apply them and become better, if that makes sense. So give people an idea of Richard before taking the red pill, if you will, and this is very much a reference to the matrix, right? Red pill or blue pill. It's not a it's not a political deal. It's uh, it's uh, which version of reality do you want to subscribe to? But yeah, yeah, who who were you before and then who are you after? Well, it's a fairly large change and it's a change that most guys come to themselves through some life trauma. I've seen guys come to this awakening in their 20s because of a girl that breaks their heart and they go looking for information as to why this keeps happening to them and they deal with it at a very young age. For me, it was three major life events. It was um, getting divorced and seeing how men get treated through the divorce machine in the Western world and how unfairly that is and how the gynocentric laws treat men in uh, general. The second thing was the way that um, I thought that if you always just do the right thing as an entrepreneur and service your customer and deliver great value, you'll have no troubles. And then I started to realize, well, if you become a threat to your competitors and they've got deep enough pockets and my competitors have exceptionally deep pockets, they can influence legislation and change policy, which can really... uh, throw a throw a big monkey wrench in what you're doing as a business. So that was a second life event. And then the third, I was around, um, I think I was 42. And I'd broken up with the single mom that I was dating with a couple boys. Uh, I was with her for about three years. And uh, it was just it was just one of those life events where you're like, man, I started having all the well, it worked out like this. I had symptoms like I couldn't sleep at night, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with recurring nightmares and ability to focus during the day. Stuff like that, which uh, coincidentally happened to be the same symptoms you get when you have PTSD. So something was messed up in my life and I didn't know what it was. And it was that 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 first step of, um, I guess, taking the red pill, reading the rational mail, which opened my eyes to a lot of the things that I had believed that didn't serve me. I needed to update my belief system so I can make new choices to get better results. Yeah, I, you know, I can clearly see why I latched onto, onto your work. <laughs> um, went through, uh, you know, went through my divorce, uh, about five years ago. And that was brutal, obviously, from a, a financial perspective, considering that my marriage was, uh, a full 18 months in length, uh, without a prenup, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, that was an extremely expensive lesson learned. And then around the same time, a year later, my business partner and I were conned by, by a gentleman who essentially brought our, business uh, to an end because of that. And same symptoms you had, <laughs> the amount of stress through going through that was ridiculous for, for three or four years. And just turned 40 this year, right? So I have an opportunity essentially to start my life over. And the big question is, is how do you avoid those mistakes? You know, my, as far as my evolution from, let's just say a beta male to an alpha, I was fortunate to go through that in my late 20s. But I think now, you know, hitting 40, it's, it's uh, the second half essentially. And You've got to get back to that place of essentially self-development and redefining who you want to be and how you want to live your life. And that's exactly what you've been teaching guys and and what I found so awesome about your work. Yeah. The value in updating one's belief system is underestimated. It's undervalued by so many guys. The person that I am today is not the same person I was before I got married. It's not the same person I was when I graduated high school. It's not the same person I was when I got my first payment from a customer as an entrepreneur. And... We, we as guys, I don't think recognize how important it is to update our belief systems to make better choices and get better results. And it's one of the reasons why my YouTube channel has grown so fast is it's, it's just the authenticity and the storytelling and helping guys move past sticking points and their barriers. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think they're really attracted to it and why I enjoy it so much too. So a lot of your, a lot of your time and topics is spent on dating. What would be some of the biggest essentially red pills or or points of reality that you've 
you've discovered over the last few years when it comes to women and and what's the advice that you would give to to young men who are listening to this today? Well, for those that have had the trauma in their life and are ready to, um, you know, open their eyes to the reality of the way things really work, it's, it's going to be really easy for them. But, uh, you know, some of the basic ideas that kind of travel around the manosphere, I mean, it's called a manosphere for some strange reason, I'm not sure why, but some of the basic ideas are things like frame. You know, they consider frame one of the most important things that you need to manage. When it comes to frame, you either enter her frame or she enters your frame. And what do you, what do you mean by frame for folks who don't know that? Well, picture a, a, a picture frame, you know, it's, it's, it's framing the image, you know, that, that, that story, that life, whatever it is. So if you take the relationship between a man and a woman, you know, let's use that as an example, that's an intergender relationship between a male and a female. And then that enters into a frame because now you're combining their two lives. You know, there's elements of his life and there's element of, of her life that come together. And one of the areas that men suck at so badly these days is we've been we've had feminism pounded into us since we were a little kid. You know, we try to teach boys like they're defective girls, you know, stop raping people and da 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 and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, you know, men need to embrace their masculinity and they need to understand that they are the man. And women are attracted to strong, successful men. I mean, one of the things that any guy can do if they want to up their game when it comes to the sexual marketplace and attracting a higher quality, better woman is pursue excellence. And the mistake guys make is they're pursuing women. And when you pursue women over and over again, you know, you download the app and you swipe or you download a, a or you go to a dating site and you start messaging away like crazy, you're entering their frame and you have to control the frame in any kind of intersexual dynamic for it to be successful. Women value strong, virtuous, successful men. And if you chase that excellence, women will come into your life naturally, if that makes sense. Yeah. Can we break that down into more detail? What are specifically the qualities that and areas that a guy can work on when it comes to himself to become a higher, higher value, higher, higher status guy? Well, there's been all kinds of studies done on um, what women want. And at the end of the day, all the studies pretty much reveal the same thing. They want it all. The most important things are, of course, the uh, optical cues. So, you know, wide, broad shoulders, narrow waist, carrying low b- body fat, square sort of masculine jaw, you know, not not a huge amount of muscle, but an athletic build, basically. So, the optics of good genetic disposition tall of course matters a lot to women which is which is tougher for shorter guys and the ability to provision and provide there's this notion that that women need to optimize hypergamy to be successful in life and all that really means is that women need to lock down the best value male that their hypergamy dictates that they can get let's define that for folks Well, hypergamy uh, or hypergamy, depending on how you want to pronounce it, I get slammed around sometimes in the (laughs) comments of my videos, depending on how I'm I'm saying it. But hypergamy is is women basically marrying up. You know, women don't marry or date down. The $100,000 a year junior accountant is not going to date or marry the guy that runs a hot dog stand. She's looking for the guy at her level or higher. She wants to look up at him. And it's not just, you know, he's got to make more money than her or at least the same amount of money. He's also got to signal, you know, the same sexual marketplace cues that will let her believe that he's the right kind of guy to reproduce with. Right. You know, he's going to be able to generate the right kind of offspring that she's looking for. Again, broad shoulders, thin waist, low, bo- you know, low uh, belly fat, uh, you know, strong, square sort of jaw, stuff like that. You've talked about some of those qualities and in, in, in the simple ways to acquire them, right? So pick up, pick up heavy shit, put it down, right? So, you know, when it comes to fitness and things like that, what are, what are the daily parts of your routine that you've incorporated into your life to, to help you achieve that? Well, self-care matters because I mean, women are going to look at you. It doesn't matter if you're 20 or 40, you know, the notion that it doesn't matter what he looks like is a bullshit story that women like to tell men to let them believe that they should just be themselves, which is why men shouldn't take dating advice from women. If you want to catch a fish, you ask a fisherman how to catch a fish. You don't ask another fish how to catch a fish, right? So um, women don't even know themselves, I don't believe, what it is that women want because they start telling guys things like, oh, just be yourself or be a nice guy. And these are the same guys that end up becoming, you know, locked in the friend zone or the beta orbiters. But women don't want to be with that guy. 
I'm guessing we can swear a little bit on this podcast. Yeah, sure. Women want to be with a guy that other men want to be and other women want to fuck, but that guy, but she doesn't want that guy to optimize his option to fuck. Right, right. So, you know, you start to work on yourself, you get in shape, your, your self-confidence starts to increase. And I want to get back real quick to the, the framing component of this. What does yep. it feel like when you own your frame of reality? If you could give some examples for guys to understand this of what mm-hmm. a guy who falls for a woman's frame would experience versus what it looks like for a guy who, who retains it. Well, you basically want to look at it like this. I mean, you want a woman to be a compliment to your life, not the focus of it. And, and too many guys make, make her the focus of his life. And what ends up happening is her attraction just, just comes right off a cliff, right? So you've, you've got to pursue excellence in a long-term relationship. In fact, I would even go as far to say that it's, that it's considerably harder to do well over a long-term relationship or a marriage because it's a lot more work. You know, it's, it's a hell of a lot more work than just going out on the sexual marketplace and dating, you know, here and there, because you've got to consider, you know, consistently become a better version of yourself. And, you know, the other side of the coin is that is the reward for the guy is being with the same person, you know, his entire life in a monogamous type of scenario, which doesn't always work out for him in the best way. Guys that have been through the divorce machine knows what, you know, know what that looks like because it's, it's a, it's a very low risk, high reward proposition for women, but the opposite's true for men. Uh, but we're kind of getting, getting off track on the frame thing. But I mean, the whole point of frame is you want to be able to control it. You want the woman to enter your frame. She wants to enter your frame. This lie that, you know, has been told to the world for the last, you know, 50, 60 years since third wave feminism has just gone so far that men and women, you know, especially men have now believed that, uh, well, we've got to serve her needs. You know, we've got to make her, uh, bigger, you know, we got to bigger up. We got to make her a better version of herself at, at our cost. But, but women don't want that. They haven't wanted that for millions of years and they still don't want it today. And just because, you know, feminism doesn't know when to put on the brakes, and, and, and keep pandering to people and telling them, you know, to man up and just keep doing these things for women. It leads to a lot of dissatisfaction. I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a really good example. Cause I was just talking to a, a clinical psychologist about this the other day on my channel, when it comes to the division of uh, household chores and labor, you know, women and men are now told today, you know, divide them up. It doesn't matter who does the dishes and cooks and things like that you know, who's ironing the clothes, but that's, that's the narrative. Yeah. But mm-hmm. the reality is studies have all revealed that, that women are incredibly dissatisfied in long-term marriages and relationships where he's cooking and doing the dishes and not cutting the grass or changing the oil on the car or swapping the summer tires out for the winter tires. She wants her guy to take on a masculine role in that relationship. And the guy needs to operate in that frame. He needs to say, you know what? I take care of the outside and I'm going to take care of changing oil in the cars and I'm going to take care of rotating the tires and I'm going to teach Billy how to ski and, you know, do certain things. You know, I'm going to get him a BB gun and we're going to zero in the scope together and that'll be our thing. And, you know, you can teach him how to make pancakes in the morning sort of thing. And it's not like you need to, you know rip off your shirt and bare your chest and start beating on it and say, I'm the man. And that's how it works. That's not how it works. You've got to just demonstrate it by your actions. You know, you don't, you don't just slam your fist down and say, this is the way it's going to be. You've, you've just got to demonstrate it by your actions, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. So, you know, one of the, the mistakes I made going through my divorce and in and, and that relationship, because I, I just didn't have enough experience at the time to know any better is that, you know, if, uh, if your wife starts to complain about something or wants something and, and there's this general <laughs> energy of, you know, conflict or dissatisfaction as a guy, we want to fix shit, right? right. Like, okay, let, yeah, I'll do that. And then the next thing comes up. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll do that. And, you know, thinking that, okay, that's going to settle that and we'll go back to being good. Uh, but the problem is, is that it doesn't end up that way. And in fact, the list gets longer and nothing ever works until it, all just completely blows up because the guy feels like, or at least I felt no matter what I did, I can't win. Right. Well, that's the thing, right? I mean, a couple of things that totally kill attraction in longer term relationships with women are 
are you overly available? You know, when she says jump, do you say hi? How high do you run to her aid at every single moment? You know, things like that, you know, beyond being rudderless as a guy, you know, of course, that's going to turn her off. But doing all of these things over and over again and jumping through all these hoops turns them off. It's 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 unbelievable because women tell guys that this is what you need to do. Other guys tell guys that, that this is what you need to do. But guys need to wake up to the reality that just because somebody says something, it doesn't mean that it's true. You know, what's the story behind the story? I was at a conference back in the fall and there was, you know, it was a men's conference and there was a bunch of guys there that were divorced. And we were kind of having this like dinner and this round table where we were just shooting the shit as men. And one of the things that, that, that came up from a bunch of the divorced guys was they were incredibly alpha when they got married. But by the end of their marriage, towards the end, at the divorce, they were completely beta. They had lost a uh, check in reality with who they were as guys. I see these guys at the gym, you know, I'll give you another great example. I was at the gym, I'm bald, so I shave my head and I'm, you know, I'm just cleaning up and shaving my head. And a guy comes over to me, he was about the same age as me, well overweight, you know, had the barbed wire tattoo around his arm, like the bad boy tattoo we all used to get about 20 years ago. And um, he looks at me, he goes, hey, that must feel good. I'm like, yeah, so why don't you shave your head? Because he had a, he had a, one of those really bad comb overs. I said, you know, so why don't you do it? He goes, eh, well, my wife won't let me. And I just thought to myself, yeah, there's another beta that just, you know, you know, he killed his inner alpha and became a, a beta. And he's the guy that's not sleeping with his wife. You know, he's the guy that's complaining to his friends that nothing's good in the marriage and that she browbeats him all the time, right? Right. And so, <laughs> you know, it's like... It comes back to at that point, there's got to be uh, a focus on regaining your confidence and being willing to essentially stand up for yourself and, and own your frame, right? So getting in shape is a big part of that, uh, not only from a, the way you look and an attraction standpoint, but I think from a, a hormonal standpoint as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the importance of getting in the gym every day, working on yourself and the role that that plays and allowing you to get back to that point? Yeah, that's one of the things that I chat about a lot on my channel because I don't think guys put enough emphasis on what they look like. And it's not just what you look like outside, you know, you're the body that we're in. I mean, as far as I know, this is the only one that I get when I die. That's it. I'm six feet under and I'm dust. So uh, I don't get a new one when I turn 60 or anything. So why wouldn't I take care of it? Why? I mean, why would I put premium fuel in my supercar, but not put it in my body? I mean, is my body not more important than my car? But people put higher priorities on their cars, their pets, and other th other areas of their life, and they're not pursuing excellence within themselves. If you're getting out of the shower and you're looking down and you can't see your manhood, you need to do something about that. Uh, women are not going to be attracted to you if you're on the on the sexual marketplace, and if you're married or in a long term relationship, you're not going to have a great relationship with your spouse if you don't look hot. Again, you know, women want to be with guys that other women want to be with, and other guys want to be sort of thing. So. Picking up heavy shit, putting it down, building muscle not only makes you look good, makes you fit in clothes better, puts your shoulder back, make, you know, makes you sit up straight sort of thing, but it also improves your, your hormone balance in your body. I mean, if you're not waking up in the morning with boners over the age of 40, there's something wrong with your testosterone, right? You know, there's a whole bunch of reasons behind it, you know, beyond health. Yeah, no, absolutely agreed. For the guys who are about to get married or they're married I remember going through this phase as soon as you're, as soon as you're married, it felt like you'd caught, you know, the, the gazelle you were chasing, right? And, and the chase is over and you're like, well, okay, now what? And I think that goes for both, both parties, men and women. And I've had a few men's get, a few friends get married recently and I've seen that dynamic in their lives change as well, where it's like all of the excitement and thrill and everything went away within a month. Right. Now they've got a roommate. <laughs> right. So why right. does that happen and how do you prevent it? Because guys get lazy. You know, they think that once they lock down a girl, that's it. They have to stop doing the work. They get fat. They start stuffing their face with garbage. You know, they move less because like one of the things that ends up happening when men and women live together is competition. Anxiety starts to disappear. Right. So most guys can probably relate to what I'm about to tell you. But if you're dating, uh, you know, if you're on the sexual marketplace and you're dating and you're dating more than one woman simultaneously in a non-monogamous fashion, there's a lot of competition anxiety that happens out there between you and the opposite sex because they don't know what you're up to on Thursday night when they say, hey, what are you up to? Da, da, da. And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm busy. I got something going. I'll see you on uh, Sunday or whatever. You don't need to go down the rabbit hole of explaining every element of your life and what you're doing and who you're seeing and who you spend time with. So the thing that works the best uh, for so many guys is what's between women's ears is their brain. Just let them try to rationalize and, you know, figure it out 
for themselves. And that creates a lot of competition anxiety. So they behave beautifully. You know, they're very kind and sweet and they'll do all kinds of great things and they don't browbeat you because they know that they haven't got you locked down for themselves. And women get comfortable too, you know, just as much as guys do. So, you know, men will notice all the time. I mean, I I have so many coaching calls right now with my uh, clients and the people that watch my videos that book me for one-on-one time. And one of the common themes is, you know, things were great when we were dating and then she moved in and then we stopped having sex or we were having sex like, you know, like a third as much as what we used to. And then it like waned right down to maybe like once a month or once every couple of weeks. And it's like you said, that's not a healthy relationship. That's a roommate that maybe you sometimes have sexual intercourse with. It's not like that crazy, you know, monkey sex you had hanging from the chandelier when you first started dating and she'd spend the night over and then you'd see her again four days later. And maybe you saw somebody else in between as you're kind of weighing out your options that's when things are greatest. So you have to keep an element of competition anxiety going between you and the other person if you want things to be great. So how do you balance that, right? So that's the big question. How do you balance that if what you do want is a long-term relationship, right? Like I've got a few friends, not many, but they've got phenomenal uh, relationships. They're married. They've been married five plus years. They're happier than ever. It's like they're still dating and it's fantastic, right? So if you want to build a life with someone over a long period of time, how do you get everything, right? How do you have your cake and eat it too, essentially? Well, I'd suspect there's probably some common elements between those handful of people that have been married for five years that that still have great relationships. Uh, She probably operates within his frame. He still maintained his alpha card. Uh, He's still the man in the relationship. There's probably a little bit of time that passes between when they see each other, which creates a little bit of competition anxiety. I've noticed that that um, happens a lot with um, one of my best friends has been married for 22 years. And he's a guy that will say, you know, I just had the best sex of my life with my wife, you know, th- you know, the other day. And we're kind of looking at him like, you sure that was with your wife? And he's like, yeah, no, I'm not seeing anybody else. Just me and her. It's always been her. Right. And it's because this guy owns a business that forces him to travel and he's away about three to four days a week on average. And then they get back together and it's like, you know, that's like they haven't seen each other. It's like the whole absence makes the heart grow fonder. But as soon as you're working, you know, nine to five and it's like who drops off the kids and who picks them up and the extracurriculars and how do we prepare food? And then you get into this like monotony, this like boring ass rhythm of just, you know, nothingness, you know, this 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 empire of nothingness. And that's what kills a lot of the attraction. I mean, the very same woman that's on the sexual marketplace dating right now that's in her early 40s that will have wild monkey sex with me is the same one that will tell me the same story that, well, I was married for 10 years and I didn't want to have sex with them and it just wasn't interesting to me. And, you know, the last time that I had sex with them, I went to the bathroom and I cried to myself. And I'm like, I'm thinking, are you the same person that was just doing this, that and the other thing? Right. So all women are capable of extreme passion and sexual desire and all that. It's like men need to take responsibility for masculinity and owning their own shit and chasing excellence instead of chasing women. And they'll be spoiled for choice if they do that correctly. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely agree with that. It's really easy to stand out <laughs> as a guy from, uh, you know, and I think women will say that as well. Like my perception and the feedback I've gotten from my, my female friends is that it's unbelievably difficult to find uh, a great man. Right. It's yeah. On 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 today's sexual marketplace, it's really easy to stand out if you're world class at what you do. And that that doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that you need to make a million dollars a year and drive a three hundred thousand dollar luxury vehicle. It just means that you're world class at what you do. I mean, you can take a guy like Jordan Peterson as an example. Everybody knows that name, of course. He's not he's not red pilled. You know, he married his one itis, you know, he married the girl across the street from him. He, you know, he chased her down. A lot of the stuff that he talks about in his videos is about when it comes to relationships, he talks a lot about negotiating in the relationship and you can't negotiate in a relationship with your partner because all that ends up doing is it creates obligated compliance, which ends up being resentment. So, The only reason why he's been married as long as he's been and he hasn't gone through the divorce machine is because the guy is world class at what he does. He stands up on a stage. I mean, he can book an auditorium and talk about the Bible and fill it with more people than what a priest can put in a church on a Sunday. So his wife looks at that and goes, that guy's amazing. Yeah. Right, right. right. Yeah, absolutely. What are some of the ways that you teach guys to, 
identify really high quality women? You kind of, <laughs> you've got to filter for what I call high virtue, low drama women. Okay. I've done some videos on my channel about stuff like this. Uh, so, so let me give you an example. So one of the problems we've got in today's world is men have essentially become entertainment to women. You know, we've become clowns to them because for men, uh, sex is the currency, you know, for women, it's more or less attention. So when they go into social media and if you have a reasonably attractive woman, if she gets into the habit of posting regular, you know, sexually provo provocative photographs of herself with the only intention of getting likes, hearts, comments from guys, you go girl, you look beautiful. Oh, I can't. Oh, the things I would do with you this weekend and blah, blah, blah. And it's like you get like these hundreds of comments and, you know, thousands of likes. That's a high drama woman that 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 has a problem with attention seeking behavior. And that's something that you would filter for. I'm not saying don't date her. All I'm saying is don't marry her, don't get into a longer term relationship with her. But when you get out in the sexual marketplace and you start dating women in a non-exclusive basis, you'll be able to see very quickly, you know, you'll separate the chaff from the wheat sort of thing. You know, the cream will automatically rise to the top as you do that. So you'll start to notice certain behaviors that are very low on the desirability scale and stuff that's higher on the desirability scale. You know, so on the same on the same topic, Richard, one of the the first videos that I I found for yours, and it also happens to be uh, the most watched, is is on this topic, right? Like three tests to filter for for a high quality woman. You've taught you just talked about one of the primary ones. What would you say the others are? All right, so let's talk about a couple of tests from that video. So the first one that I mentioned in that video was basically the coffee test. If you've been dating a woman for a little bit, let's say a few dates, you know, you've gone out, you've had a few drinks, maybe had dinner together, sort of thing. The coffee test is as simple as you're going somewhere, you know, in Canada, we've got Tim Hortons and Starbucks, you know, Timmy's is probably the most popular one. So you're, so you're driving along and you say, you know, I'd love to grab a, a coffee with a couple cream in it. Forgot my wallet at home. Do you mind spotting me on this one and see how she responds? And all that test basically does is, I mean, you're talking about a buck 50 for most people. And if she protests and gives you a hard time or, or starts to try to shame you about forgetting your wallet or I'm never paying for a guy and blah, blah, blah you've got a problem with that one. You know, that's, that's a big red flag. Another test that you can kind of filter for is you can kind of have something along the lines of what I call the prenup conversation. Again, you've been dating for a little bit. You kind of want to get a feel for what she's all about, what her value system's like. And you tell her something like, Hey, you know, I was with some friends and you know, one of the conversations that came up during that, you know, dinner, uh, was, um, somebody was talking about getting a prenup and it, and it was, you know, presented. I was just wondering what your take on that would be. And just sit back and listen. And if she protests or says, well, I would never do that because that's, you know, that's basically a divorce contract or that just implies things are going to fail. She's really trying to optimize for her hypergamy at that point, And that's very important or she's not self-sufficient. You probably see signals uh, of that in her life by that point based on how she lives, the kind of car that she drives, what she does for a job sort of thing, what her apartment looks like or her house, you know, whatever that might look like. But essentially, if you have those uh, straightforward conversations in an open and honest way to try to gauge and understand what their belief system looks like, then you can decide whether or not you kind of want to bring this girl forward for future dating, maybe consider her for a long term relationship or if, you know, having kids is something you want to do, maybe even marriage. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. That those make sense. I like those a lot. Coming up on the the last uh, you know, kind of third of, of the show here, I'd like to dive into what I think is a really important topic. This is life changing. It changed my life in my 20s, yours as well. I don't think there's anything else that a guy can accomplish that will make more of an impact, which is how do you become an alpha male? That's an interesting question because there's some people that will tell you that you're either born with it or you're not. And I think most boys are born, I think pretty much every boy is born with alpha male characteristics and traits. But the problem is, is that society tends to beat it out of us. Be kind, be nice, stop picking on him, don't hit him, you know. And then we slowly but surely feminize boys into the point where they think that they've got to behave like defective girls. So for men to be alpha, in my opinion, they've got to project I think it's Jack Donovan. He wrote it in one of his books. Uh, I believe it was A Way of Men, but there's the tactical virtues of men, which is basically strength, courage, mastery, and honor. Are you strong? You know, are you built? Do you have muscles? Do you have broad shoulders and a small waist? Courage. Are you courageous? Are you willing to do things that people aren't willing to do? Are you willing to 
you know, uh, go and get something from the burning house that everybody else is hiding behind bushes from, you know, sort of thing. Mastery. Are you world class at what you do? It doesn't matter if you are an accountant, uh, a geeky accountant with pencils and, you know, pop bottle glasses, or if you're a firefighter, but are you world class at what you do? Are you a master at your craft? If, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, are you, are you top in that category or class of business that you operate in? Uh, strength, courage, mastery, and honor, honor. Are you a man of your word? You know, a lot of those things really matter. Like if other guys look towards you as an older brother, then you've mastered all of those traits of alpha dumb basically is the way that I would put it. Mm. You know, I'm trying to think back as, as far as how, how a guy makes that transition, right? Cause you can have the list, but it's at the end of the day, it's how you feel about yourself. It's an internal shift. And I think the, the part that helped me uh, the most was uh, observing it in others, right? So watching guys that I looked up to and how they acted in difficult situations or around women or whoever it may be, I needed to see examples in order to really understand it and to get it and to give essentially myself permission to to adopt those traits, right? So for those who are listening to this who are maybe in that transition, I've always referred to it as beta, pre-alpha, and alpha. If you're kind of in the pre-alpha phase where this makes sense to you and, and that's a, a transition or transformation you want to make the best thing you can go do is to plug into guys who've already made it and and really study them and and participate in their lives and and observe right and so richard i think your your youtube channel and and your patreon account are two phenomenal ways to go do that mm-hmm. do you have any other resources that guys should plug into who want to really you know dive into that world as far as alphadom or in general yeah. you know becoming a, yeah okay yeah. so probably one of the best resources i think guys should take a look at is uh Jack Donovan wrote a couple books. One was called The Way of Men and the other one was called uh, Becoming a, a Barbarian. And they encompass what masculinity is for men and always has been over a long period of time. You know, it again, you know, speaks towards the truth of um, the tactical virtues of men, strength, courage, mastery and honor. These things, if if you're able to master them, are extremely attractive to other women. And they'll also draw other men towards you. I mean, part of the reasons why a lot of guys watch my channel, part of the reasons why my stuff gets shared and, and even people become patrons to access the perks behind the scenes is because, you know, to some degree they want to be me. So success leaves clues, find men that you'd like to, you know, mirror in your, um, uh, class, you know, so to speak. So if you're an entrepreneur, I mean, you can go and do the things like chase down, um, everything you can that Elon Musk has ever done or Gary V and stuff like that. But there's elements of guys in certain categories that you've got to take a look at in more specific de- detail by looking at the results. So don't, so don't confuse their activity with pure accomplishment. So let me put it to the, this way. Let's take a guy like Elon Musk. So I'm an entrepreneur. I would, I would like to be world class as an entrepreneur. Elon Musk is an entrepreneur, highly successful. There's no doubt that this guy is like Iron Man. Like he could be Batman, fly people to the moon. He's got access to resources and does cool shit. But the problem with Elon Musk that keeps him from being an alpha, although some people might argue with me on this, I'd be happy to go toe to toe at any time, is he has a he has a bad habit with women. I mean, he's married the same woman uh, twice. He's been married three times now. He was pining over his one-itis with, um, uh, I can't remember her name, but she was married to Johnny Depp for a bit, and then he married her, and she's got all kinds of psychological issues, but... He was unable to function during the Tesla Model 3 launch because of his pining for this woman that broke his heart. So while he might appear top class, take a look at all the results that they have. And then you want to go and try and mirror somebody that's like top shelf in their category. Not to disparage Elon Musk, but just to kind of use that as an example. You know, you kind of want to look for blind spots that might be sitting around them that they may not be seeing. That makes a lot of sense. Do you know any married couples that would be able to provide an example to to learn from that's uh you know just just fantastic if someone wants to go down that road? I only know them personally so I wouldn't be able to mention the name on the podcast but as far as high profile people that you could point to you know I don't follow a lot of the news I don't have cable so it's hard for me to kind of like look towards a celebrity or anybody along that line that is world class at it. Gotcha. Yeah, no worries. This is an interesting, interesting facet of life for sure. And, you know, I'm really grateful for all of the leadership that you've put out on uh, on your channel and what you're doing for guys out there who are, are going through tough, 
tough transitions actually, in life like this. So actually, Mike here, I got one for you because I'm just on your website. I'm just scrolling down at all the people that you've that you've interviewed. Hmm. Uh, Sean, Sean Whalen would be a pretty good example of that. Yeah, Sean's Sean's great. Well, I can't let you go. We've got we've got about ten minutes left. I can't let you go without talking about cars. <laughs> yeah, man. What do you <laughs> want to talk about? Yeah. You tell me your tell me your poison. What what gets you excited? What do you love? I just love driving fast cars. Like I'll it doesn't matter. I've done off road racing in Baja three times now. I've, oh, I've tell, tell me about tell me about that. There's a, a class of cars in the Baja 1000 called the Challenge Cars, which this company basically rents out to racers during the race and in the off season they'll do tours with them. Yeah, wide, so they're wide, highly, wide open Baja. Wide open, yeah. So yep. super capable cars. They're not going to do 200 miles an hour, but if you're doing, you know, 90 miles an hour off road with the suspension b- bouncing around like crazy, it feels like you're doing a million miles an hour. So that's a hell of a lot of fun. You know, you're just ripping through the desert, dodging cactuses and animals and cattle and other cars coming the other way around blind bends and stuff like that. So I ra- I, I'll, I'll jump in because I raced the 2008 Baja 1000 with them. Nice. And it was the biggest and still has been the biggest adventure of my life. Yeah, it's it's like the most fun that you can have with your clothes on, if I'm being honest with you. So anything with fast cars that I can drive around a course, whether it's a closed course or, you know, off road down, you know, the Mexican desert. I'm all about that. On the same topic, I caught I caught the bug. So that was the first ever time I'd ever been in a, a race car with a helmet on. So I went from zero to the Baja 1000. <laughs> um, nice. And if, if you guys are listening to this and you want to go on one of those adventures too, there's a, a, a spinoff of that called Zero One Odysseys out of Vegas. And we go do tours through Nevada with them every year. And they also race uh, their cars in the Mint 400. So I've done that with them twice. I actually won, I think, two years ago, three years ago. Nice. Uh, the Mint 400. I soloed that and did the whole, did the whole stretch. And, and uh, it's just, it's awesome. So that's super cool. I've, I've met very few people who've dove into the off-road world. Yeah, off-road world, on-road world, supercars, exotic cars. I love it all. I mean, one of the things I did last year, too, is um, I, I had a bucket list item, and it was drive 200 miles an hour while listening to Motley Crue's Kickstart My Heart. So I wrote this on a bucket list, like, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And I started looking at the bucket list last year, and I'm like, fuck, I got to start crossing some of these things off. And I found an outfit in the UK that had access to the holy trinity of hypercars. So the LaFerrari, the McLaren P1, and the Porsche 918. And they had a whole bunch of other warm-up cars. So I did that last spring and I hit, uh, I think it was 204 miles an hour and a strong headwind down the edge, uh, airstrip while listening to Motley Crue's Kickstart My Heart. So that was, nice. that was a lot of fun. Which, uh, which of those was your favorite? Well, unfortunately, the P1 caught fire that day, so I didn't get my go in that. <laughs> and the 918 was in an accident uh, three months before. So the only car that was capable of blowing, through, blowing past 200 was the LaFerrari, which was, you know, which was plenty of power. So it, it's, you know, it, like these cars are going to be a thing of the past. Like we're not going to see these in 10 or 15 years. We're going to be having electric cars. We're going to get in them and push a button and it's going to take us somewhere. So I've got such a strong passion for cars myself. And I know there's a community of men out there that do as well. I bought a um, a gated manual transmission V10 R8 last year, which is the last of its kind. So I'm probably going to get into collecting more of these cars that are never going to be made again. And I might as well enjoy them because I mean, you only live once, right? Yeah, no, I I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I you know I have a seven year old, and I'm like, there's a there's an eighty percent chance he's not going to have a driver's license. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, the insurance to be in a non automated car ten years from now is probably going to be through the roof. Yeah, and you're going to be limited to you know track private track stuff. Exactly. Um, exactly. and it's going to be really interesting to see what that does to motorsport. Yeah. <laughs> you know, too. So what's your uh, what's your all time favorite? If you could only have one car, what would it be? I think one of my all time favorite cars, and this is what most guys will go back to is something from their childhood. For me, it was a 1969 Boss 429 Mustang in white. Mm, nice. Beautiful. My uh, my uncle had one of those in yellow. And uh, yeah. man, that's it's hard to beat that era era of Mustang from just a, a looks standpoint. Yeah, it's such a good looking car. It looks just so badass. Yeah, that's awesome. I've owned uh, I've owned all of the R8s, the original V8 coupe, the the V10 Spider uh, that you're referring to. I never had the manual though, and then I I tried the new the new one, and I drove it for three days and I took it back. I didn't like wow. it. It felt like all of the personality was gone, and it felt like you're driving a PlayStation type pre programmed deal. And so I took that back. I think my all time favorite, if I could only have one car these days, would be. The four five eight Spider, the Ferrari. Really? Have you driven the McLarens yet? Uh, I have. So I've 
I've had a, a four five eight spider and I've had the four eight eight spider and yeah. my buddy's got a six fifty S. Yeah. And for me with a car, it's all about exhaust. Um, right. Right. I, Ferraris I, do that really well. Yeah, and I've just found, you know, a naturally aspirated car that goes to nine thousand RPM. I have yet to find a thrill that exceeds that. Yeah. And today I I got rid of my four eight eight primarily for that reason. It was a cool car, just for the for the money. It didn't light my hair on fire like the 458 did. Mm -hmm. uh, but today I'm driving the new 991.2 GT3. Yeah, the GT3 is a nice category. Oh, if you get a chance, yeah, if you get a chance, uh, grab the keys to a 720S. Those things are unbelievable. They're they're just in, like a brand new level. They're basically in hypercar level at exotic car prices. Um, I've, I've driven it. I've driven it. And here's my thing. I think it's the most beautiful car on the planet. It feels yeah. like you're in a spaceship. Yeah. It's so quiet. <laughs> like it's so quiet. I'm like. Oh, Throw this a titanium is killing exhaust me. on it. Yeah, I drove that in the 570 back to back, and I was like, "I'll take the 570." Like yeah. it just had so much more personality to it. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm yeah. hoping the VLT version will be much more raw and visceral. And yeah, it's coming out in 2019. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Nice, awesome, yeah. very cool. Well, uh, do you ever make it out to any rallies? Have you done Gold Rush yet, or anything like that? I haven't done Gold, gold Rush, but I'm a member of a couple of. Uh, exotic car clubs in Toronto. So, you know, we do these fall drives through Muskoka, get to, get to see all the colors and the rolling hills and cliffs and stuff like that. So it's a lot nice. of fun. Nice. Well, maybe we can, we can get a crew together and go do uh go do gold rush or something. Cause I have not done one of those yet, but I've got, I've got that on my list. So I'm looking cool to, to knocking that off. Awesome. Well, Richard, this has been a real pleasure. Obviously we've got, we've got a lot of similar, similar stories through life and, and, and passions as well. So it's been a lot of fun for, uh, for me to, to participate in this. Where can folks go to plug into your work, obviously, on YouTube? And then I know, again, you do personal consulting calls as well or coaching calls for guys who are going through some tough transitions. Yeah. So most of my stuff I create on YouTube right now. Uh, so it's just entrepreneurs and cars. A lot of the premium work that I used to do on YouTube, I now put behind a Patreon paywall just because of algorithms and the way YouTube behaves. So I have Patreon support, more exclusive content that's less politically correct that I can talk about more openly to a gentleman's audience. There's all kinds of perks in there, like a private Facebook community and uh, exclusive video content and Q and a sessions that are live and exclusive to that community. Also on Twitter and uh, Instagram at entrepreneurs in cars. Awesome, brother. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the time today. I appreciate your, your contribution to, uh, to all of us guys out there and looking forward to, uh, to your next video. Thank you so much. Thanks brother. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. As always, uh, if you loved this show, leave us a review on iTunes. I'd appreciate that very much. And please go check out the new platform at selfmademan.com. Uh, we're absolutely thrilled to have all of y'all as new members if you've joined. And if you haven't joined yet, go check it out. And I uh, look forward to having you as a part of the community. Thanks so much. Thanks.